Learn more about what we do at strangers.guide.com or connect with me after this session. Today I'm excited to introduce our speakers. Koi Vin is a Senior Director of Design at Adobe and one of Fast Company's most creative people in business. A leading figure in the design community for more than two decades, he writes a widely read blog on design technology at subtraction.com and hosts Wireframe, a documentary podcast about design. As a young professional designer, John Rods studies UX design at SCAD. He works on products and services across tech, art, and education, and the education industry. He also mentors and stays connected with young Latinos introduced, introduced, interested in design. In an industry where Latinos are underrepresented, John believes he will make a difference in driving design innovation and systems inclusive of his culture. Please join me in welcoming everyone to the stage. Good morning. Um, yeah, this is my first time back at South by Southwest in over a decade, and I do remember Saturday evenings, it was a big party night, Sunday mornings is not a big session <laughs> time. So thanks for coming. I think you guys are the true, like salt of the, the earth, the, the true heart of uh, South by Southwest. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today about um, building a more diverse pipeline uh, of design talent. And actually, if I were to offer you a, like an alternate title for this talk, it would be taking diversity personally. I think that's, that's really the theme of what I'm, I'm going to talk about today. Um, so a little bit about me. I, I work at Adobe. I've worked um, at Adobe for uh, about six years now. Um, but I've had a long career in design. I've worked at small companies and large companies, startups and late stage, media. Um, and, and technology, and I've worked with all different kinds of design teams. And you know, one thing that I've seen throughout my career is a, a real um, a desire to, to uh, diversify uh, the workforce uh, within the design industry. Um, and it's been going on a long time, and the progress has been slow. And I really feel like we're at a point now where diversity is really an imperative for our industry for any number of reasons. Um, uh, just the, like purely from a social justice perspective, but also from the perspective of needing the companies that we do design for to step up to the next level. We need a, a, a greater diversity of thought, of ideas, of backgrounds, of cultures, of conversations to happen in order to help undo some of the challenges that design has helped technology create over the past decade. Uh, but progress has been slow. Now, I'm not going to um, inundate you with a bunch of numbers, but one really useful perspective on this comes from AIGA, which did a design census in 2021. Um, and um, one of the key findings from there was that um, in the US, the design community really under indexes for black and Latinx uh, practitioners. Um, if you look at the, the numbers of uh, black practitioners in design, uh, uh, by their measure, it's only just under 5% uh, compared to about 12.6% of the total US workforce. Similarly for Latinx, we have 9%. That's better, but still just half of the 18% of the total workforce um, that are Latinx. And so we are really not doing great as an industry. We're doing le less than half, I would say. And as an industry, given all of our progressive inclinations, I think we should be doing better than the US average. So we're really far off. Um, but you know you don't really need these numbers to understand if you're in the design industry. And if you look around at the teams that that um, are assembled today, uh, there are some teams that are truly diverse, but they are few and far between. Uh, by and large, these teams are very, very um, skewed towards Caucasian and and Asian designers, and um, it's not nearly as diverse as it could be or as we want it to be. So. I think the conclusion that I've come to is like really making a commitment to design is relative, I mean, commitment to diversity is relatively easy. You, I think, don't have to go very far to see companies and teams say, yeah, we really want a more diverse uh, a workforce. We really want a more diverse uh, talent pool um, coming into design, coming into technology. But actually achieving that diversity is quite difficult. Now, Adobe, we take this really seriously, and, and um, there's a lot of really thoughtful, dedicated people who have been working on this problem for a long time. And there are three basic um, tenets um, that our efforts can be boiled down to. First is building a diverse pipeline. Second is attracting diverse candidates. And third is really enhancing the employee experience for our diverse employees. Um, so I'm going to run through these uh, really briefly for you. This is really not meant to be um, a, 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 a session where, where we're patting ourselves on the back, but I think it is useful to, to see how we've tackled this problem. 
Um, so first, for building a diverse pipeline, this is really about investment into the design talent pool, scholarships, partnering with different um, organizations that help get people into technology, um, you know, engaging with historically bl black colleges and universities and Hispanic-serving institutions, um, tribal colleges and women's colleges, really um, uh, putting uh, uh, like our investment into the, 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 the wider population to try to bring more people into this industry. And then the second is um, attracting a more diverse, attra attracting more diverse candidates. This is really about sort of like optimizing the process of bringing people into the the interviewing process and and getting exposure to um, Adobe's uh, opportunities. Um, you know, we we have a number of um, we're continually optimizing, uh, continually to optimize our hiring practices to make sure that it's they're fair and inclusive. We've got a dedicated diversity talent acquisition team. Um, we've got a number of programs programs that sort of actively um, engage with, um, with schools and universities to try to, to, to bring people into the hiring process. And the third is really enhancing the employee experience. This is really about being vigilant, about making sure that the uh, diversity candidates that, that we do hire are able to get onboarded successfully, are able to, um, to, to, uh, to flourish and to continue to expand their influence in their region, hopefully help make uh, Adobe a more inclusive place and more attractive place for more diverse candidates. Um, so, I think there's a lot of great work being done here, and I think many companies are doing this as well. But one thing that I've noticed as a designer is there's a, really a difference between optimizing for diversity in tech versus optimizing for diversity in design. They're related, but they're quite different. I, th I think if you've been involved in design, you know that um, uh, uh, recruiting for design is is really not quite not exactly the same as recruiting for technology, and all the programs that go into bringing people into tech in general don't always address the specific needs of designers and and uh, the specific challenges of bringing um, designers um, of, from underrepresented backgrounds into the industry. And so, a big conclusion for me is like really design leadership is really responsible for design culture in many ways, and therefore responsible for uh, diversity as well. So we, when you think about it, we're the ones who, act, who, who do the actual hiring, we're the ones who assemble our team and make sure we have the right mix of talents and, and backgrounds, and so we're in, the, we're in the position to really affect material change. It's also really about like personal responsibility too. Like as, um, as leaders ourselves, we have to sort of think about like what we're contributing back to um, the industry and the opportunities that we're making available. Um, because you know, diversity is really easy to regard only in the abstract, right? Like um, there's, a, there's lots of talented people at our company working on this. And so as a design leader or as a designer, like our day-to-day -day is focused on building a product or working with clients or you know, doing the actual design. And it's easy to think about this is a problem that the company at large is going to focus on. But the key really is to try to personalize the challenge and take it on ourselves and sort of think about like what we can do as individuals or as leaders and what, what we can do with the, the tools that we have in order to, to uh, bring greater diversity into uh, our places of work. And so like we think about asking the question like what is possible right now with the tools that we have on our teams, uh, in our you know, business units, or at the, co the company at large, things that we can tap into in order to make this stuff happen to really to, to meet these challenges in, in a much more material way. And so um, at Adobe, um, a few of us a few years ago started really trying to think of, about this problem for design and thinking about like how we can make an impact specifically on the pipeline, the top of the funnel, if you will, bringing as many people as possible into the process. Um, and when we sort of took a look at what the challenges were for people from underrepresented uh, backgrounds coming into the design community, we sort of uh, in, were able to settle on a few key challenges. And these were actually reflected in the a uh, AIGA design census that I mentioned earlier, uh, which is a terrific resource. I mean, the first one is a lack of access to really productive networks for design. The idea that, you know, 
that careers are very often built in large part on good networking, on having access to the quote unquote right people, you know, getting, being in the right place at the right time to uh, get a referral for a job. That's really key and it's, it's actually um, uh, very difficult to get that access if, if you're not in an environment that is already conducive to that. Uh, a lack of support from family, from uh, funding, from mentoring, from you know, being around people who sort of innately understand the potential of going down uh, a career, going down the path of pursuing a career in design, the way that um, most people understand the potential of pursuing a degree in medicine or, or the law. And of course, a financial barrier, like design is an expensive um, uh, education to pursue. Um, it's often available only in uh, uh, you know, private institutions, and so um, that is a big challenge too. So as we got together and started thinking about these problems, you know, um, one of the things that really made sense is really thinking about a design scholarship specifically for practitioners in UX, UI design in the industry. Um, you know, um, we've, we've got a number of scholarships in technology and those are great, but we thought there was, there was a place for something specifically focused on the, this new generation of designers who are pursuing UX design. And it's sort of like an ideal convergence of Adobe's interests and uh, the industry's priorities and just actually social, like, social impact, like doing good for the sake of doing good. You know, Adobe's like the only multi-billion dollar company out there with a key customer base um, in, who are in part creative professionals. And so we have you know, this opportunity to do something great for them and also a responsibility to, to contribute something back to the, uh, to the industry. But like, we hadn't started a design scholarship or a scholarship of any kind before, and I had no idea what it took to do that. I had a very, I personally had a very superficial understanding of the, the higher education industry in general. I'd taken out a bunch of student loans when I was younger, and then once I paid them off, I didn't really think about that at all. Didn't understand like the legalities of scholarships or or uh, like how it's managed or how you, you manage or how you do the application process or any, any of that. Um, but what I did know as a design leader, as a, you know, a manager over the years is I did understand how to put together a spreadsheet, which you know, at one time or another designers have to sit down and sort of really figure out the numbers for a project, for resources, for budgets or some sort. So I figured the least thing I could do is sit down and sort of like model out what it would take to say, uh, provide a scholarship of $5,000 a year to 100 students or you know, $50,000 a year to five students or whatever it took, just sort of get my arms around the size uh, of the commitment that we would, could, we would be asking Adobe for. And then, as, as you do in big companies, what I did is I put together a, a, a deck with my colleagues, sort of laying out the challenge, the opportunity, trying to propose this idea of putting together a scholarship, trying to give some insight into what would be necessary to bring it, bring it to life and to manage it going forward. Um, and then we took it and we shopped it around all different parts of the company. We talked to people in communications and product and engineering, anybody who would listen to us and, um, uh, and could give us a, a pointer as to how to get this kind of thing done. And eventually we were lucky enough to find sympathetic ears, people who were really interested in the proposition and helped bring it to life. And ultimately what we settled on was $25,000 a year for four years for uh, cohorts of 10 scholars for each year. Um, so basically, if you uh, win one of these scholarships, you get $100,000 over the, the course of your undergraduate uh, degree um, in a design or design-related um, field. And so we were eventually able to uh, put together what we call the Design Circle Scholarship. And I'll, I'll talk about the Design Circle idea in, in a few moments, but this is a scholarship that we kicked off in 2020. We're able to, um, to uh, award this to two cohorts of 10 scholars each. And actually, the, um, there's a third cohort for 2022. The, um, the application process for that is closing tomorrow. So, um, so if you're interested in this, uh, there's always 2023. But um, uh, before too long, we'll be able to announce that third cohort and we'll have brought 30 uh, scholarships uh, to bear um, and basically have 30 people uh, pursuing uh, undergraduate degrees in design, which I find very gratifying and, um, and um, it's, it's really been worth like all the hard work that we've done, um, especially 
when you see where these people come from and you get to talk to them, you know, we, we've had scholars come from the Philippines, Mexico, Turkey, Russia, Nigeria, the United Kingdom, all over the United States and Canada. And we've helped them go to Yale, to Columbia, to Texas A&M, to a whole diverse range of schools of all sizes where they're uh, pursuing design-related degrees. It's tremendously exciting. In fact, um, uh, our, one of our scholars who's right now going to the Savannah College of Art and Design, we're going to bring him on stage in a little bit to have him tell uh, you his story. Um, but overall, it's really great. Um, for me, my experience of putting this together has gone to a whole other level like once it became reality and we started reading the applications talking with uh, the the uh, the candidates and scholars really working with them and it really personalizes it on a whole different level than even when i started out and and had a great passion for this project in the very beginning like uh, like understanding the stories and really um seeing the challenges and, and getting involved with them has been incredibly gratifying um but really, this is all just a drop in the bucket. I mean, you think about it, awarding 30 scholarships is great, but you know, if you follow the rule of thumb that really only half of the people who enter a degree program looking to pursue a specific uh, vocation end up uh, actually making a living in that vocation, we're talking about maybe 15 people, hopefully, who will ultimately end up in the talent pool, which is really just a very, very tiny dent in the overall problem. We really need to scale this. Um, to a, a bigger uh, level, and we hope to collaborate with other companies to, and uh, other institutions to make this, this um, happen in the coming years. Um, and it's true that not every company can start a design scholarship, um, but you know, as design leaders, if we can really personalize this challenge and really ask ourselves what we can do to affect the change um, in our immediate environment, I think that can um, lead to uh, much more material change in the near term than we expect. Um, it, it really can make a difference. Um, so one more thing about the scholarship. You know, um, it's, the scholarship is attached to what we call the design circle, which is a kind of like an industry-wide panel that Adobe has convened of practitioners from all over the industry. And um, what they do is they mentor the scholars. They work with the scholars. Um, so it's not just a case of them you know, getting the money and then we, we, we wish them good luck. You know, we've got people from all over the industry, design leaders um, from uh, Airbnb and, and uh, Facebook and Meta and, uh, and uh, Creative Reaction Lab, which, who are key players in, in diversity in the design industry. Um, and what they do is they work with the, the scholars, they mentor them, they talk regularly with them. So you've got these undergraduate students who might be 18 or 19, very early in their journey of mastering their craft and, and um, understanding what design can do. And they're getting access to some of the, um, the most prominent practitioners in the field. And it's really this two-way street where the, the mentors are also seeing how design is changing through the eyes of these students. It's incredibly exciting. It's really a big part of this program. It really, really only serves to, to you know, make it even more personal for everybody. I think it's a really a key part of it. And for me, I've been lucky enough to work with, with a couple of these scholars. Um, and one of them, Jonathan Cale Rodriguez, we've asked him to come here today to sort of tell his story, because I think it's just really important to hear from these folks themselves, um, like uh, what they go through, what, the, uh, what it means to start uh, a, a, a path down um, the road of design for them. Um, and so um, if you would put your hands together and, and welcome Jonathan to the stage, give him a chance to tell you his story. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Rodriguez, or professionally like John Rods. And I'm going to tell you about uh, my story and how I got into design, and really how design found me. I'm going to tell you about my world and my background first. So I was born uh, in San Antonio, Texas, which is uh, the seventh largest city in the world, and uh, home to Alamo, where the river walks at, um, military city and my favorite building, which is the Tower of Americas. Uh, I grew up, uh, I was raised by my single mother, uh, and here's, there am I on the big bike, and my little brother uh, Daniel and my little sister Jenna, uh, and I was the oldest of three. Uh, I, I lived in the zip code 78237, and you're probably like, what is the zip code? 
you know, what, why are you telling me this? It was the poorest zip code in all of Texas. Uh, it was actually ranked fourth. Um, and I lived in this actual blue house. This is, a, this is actually the real picture. I lived in the blue house, and it was old. It was run down. It was, I don't know, but it had a charm. It was built by my great-grandparents when they came to San Antonio and, um, and decided they wanted to uh, live there. And I remember being there, and in the mornings, every Saturday, me and my brother would sit down, and we'd watch cartoons like Kids Next Door or Phineas and Ferb, and we just, we'd sit down with our big bowl of Fruit Loops, and we'd just eat and watch, and we'd just hang out together. And uh, I was just so inspired, and I, I just loved seeing these cartoons, and it just, I just started, I started drawing them, and I was, I feel like I was really getting into art, and, and uh, that's how I got into art. At the time, uh, since I was in the Bohor zip code, I also lived uh, where the, one of the city's poorest district. So my mom thought it was best for us to go with our grandma uh, in the, early in the morning. She'd drop us off to go to our grandma's and she'd pick us up late at night because she lived close to the biggest district in San Antonio. Um, so here's a realistic photo of me and my grandma uh, that I made when I was young. Um, I was a super quiet kid. I didn't talk much. I, I was always the one in the back, and I was always the one who were like, oh, you were in this class? I had no idea. You know, I, was, I didn't like to talk. I was super scared. I, I didn't feel like I fit in. Um, but I love, as you see, I love reading, too. Um, I, like, I like comic books. I love graphic novels. And if you gave me a book with just full of words, I would, like, throw it away. I could not. I just needed pictures all the time, always. I was also a C student. I remember in fourth grade, I came to a meeting. Uh, we had a teacher-parent meeting uh, with the teacher, and my teacher would tell me, Jonathan, you could be in gifted and talented if only your grades were a little bit better. You're just, you're just so close. And mom would be like, why are your grades so low? And I'd be like, mom, it's okay, don't worry, they'll, they'll go up eventually, they'll go up eventually. My teacher would call me slacker, they'd say, Jonathan, you slack off, and, but I always did the work at the end. But it's just hard, I, I just felt like um, I wasn't doing too good. But I, I had a dream. There's one class that I really loved, and uh, well, the dream was I wanted to be an artist, I wanted to be a creative. And I had one class that I really loved, which art class. Um, I had a teacher, Ms. Jackson, and she had, uh, she was wearing, she would always wear this jean jacket uh, with paint on it. I thought that was like exactly what artists would wear. And she was super cool. And she would always encourage me to draw whatever I wanted. Anytime we were in art class, she was like, all right, Jonathan, like, this is what we're going to do. But you know, you can do whatever you want. And I, you know, here's this little dragon I made. And it was able to go up in the show. And I was super happy. I was like, oh, this is super cool. I love doing this. You know, I, this, I definitely want to be an artist. Um, here's me at a show. Made one of the little characters. And I was able to uh, be in shows in the district. Um, and I really enjoyed it. At the, at the end of elementary school, in fifth grade, she said to me, uh, Jonathan, when uh, you win a super huge award, I'm going to hand you a box of crayons after stage, and I'm going to give it to you. And I was like, wow, like, you know, that, that, I need to be an artist now. I felt like this is how I was going. I need to go on. I feel supported. I haven't got there yet, yet Ms. Jackson, so if you're watching this, you know, uh, one day I will get there. Um, then I joined... Our, our class in middle school, and I had the meanest teacher. She was like a dragon, like just, just destroying creativity all over the place. After that, I was like, no, okay, I do not want to, I don't want to do art anymore. This is not for me. I, every time I show her art piece, she'd be like, oh, no, like, it's not good. I wasn't doing so good in that class, and I was just like super confused because I just, I thought I loved it, and, and maybe it wasn't for me, and even though I put so much effort, she would just say no. So I started hanging out uh, uh, after after school uh, with my friends in middle school, and I started, I stopped, you know, drawing. I didn't want to draw anymore. It wasn't for me. But I started watching cartoons, like Adventure Time. I came back to that. I just, you know, I love cartoons. And I loved Adventure Time. And one time I was watching Adventure Time, I finally had my, I finally had a phone, and I was researching who was a creator of Adventure Time, and it was Pendleton Wart. And he's, uh, he was from San Antonio. He was from my city. And I was like, oh, if he's from San Antonio, like, maybe I can be an animator, too. Maybe I can go into this. And he inspired me. I felt like, you know, if he can do it, I can do it, too. And then I wanted to do it. So I said, I want to be an animator. And I told my mom, I want to be an animator, and I want to go to school in California. I want to go to an animation school uh, like CalArts. So I told everyone and their mama and also my mama that I want to go. Uh, I want to be an animator. So she, she did some research, and she found a, a program called Stacy. And 
Uh, SACI is an after-school uh, nonprofit, a tuition-free arts program, right? So I would go to school, and then after school, you would go to SACI and, uh, and work there for like four hours. But she found this program. She said, Jonathan, look at this program. You know, they have a, you could be an animator here. And I was like, okay, um, well, like, what's the SACI? And, uh, you know, it's for, uh, I guess, economically disadvantaged youth. And this is a picture of SACI. This is their, their building. And there's this, they had this super huge building. And they had uh, all the Macs there. And uh, they had four programs, which is VA, uh, which is fine arts, MAS, which is film, and ALAS, which is performing arts. And Hive New Media, the one where I wanted to join. And they did stuff like game design. They did stuff like animation, something that I really wanted to go into. They, so, they, did, they did stuff like uh, comic design. They did anything you can do on a the computer. They did that. Uh, so here's a picture of me inside, and I remember going in, and yeah, I saw all the super nice Macs. It smelled like ramen noodles because they had a bistro, and you know, high schoolers after school, they're like, oh, I'm so hungry, I need ramen noodles. It smelled like that. And also sounded like reminiscing by Butter Tones. Every time I got in, they played the, uh, the most indie music. Like, I just loved it, and I, I realized uh, after listening, I like love this kind of music, too. Anyway, we're sitting down. Uh, anyway, I, she applied for me, and I was like, Mom, I don't want to do it. Don't, don't apply, but she applied for me. And we're sitting down in a water burger, uh, uh, and I thought we were just having normal dinner. Like it was just water burger, you know, normal dinner. My grandma was there too, and she pulls out an envelope and she was like, "Jonathan, guess what I have for you?" And I was like, "What is it?" I, like, uh, like I was kind of scared of it from Stacy because I didn't want to do it. Like it wasn't for me. I like hanging out after school. She hands me it. And she's like, "Open it. Do you think you got in? Do you think you got in?" And I was like, I don't know. And my little brother Danny was like, no, he did not get in, of course. Uh, it's my little brother. Um, and I was like, I don't know. Like, I'm not interested. Uh, and so I opened it. And here I am. This is a picture of me holding it. And you could see I was smiling. But inside, I was like, no, I don't want to do this, Mom. Please don't do this to me. I don't want to go after school. Because at SACI, once you join, you have to like make eight hours. You have to stay for eight hours after school. So not on top of, like, on top of Having school, I'd have to go to this after-school program for eight hours, and I was just not about that. But I stuck, I stuck with it. I mean, I had animation. Like, why not just try it? You know, maybe it would be interesting. My mom would tell me, if there's a will, there's a way. And this was my way in order to be, you know, go to school in California be an animator. So I went into the unknown. So these my, are my two instructors. Uh, just like a school, they have teachers, but we call them instructors instead. And this is Stevan on Ned, and this is me at graduation. Uh, but they really provided a community where I felt safe, and they told me that being an artist is more than, well, there's more than just being an artist and more of just being an animator. Um, they told me, like, uh, you know, they, they offered the community, and I felt like I was able to thrive there. And he told me about the scholarship. It's called the Adobe Creativity Scholarship. And I never heard of it. I was like, what, what is this? Um, and it, they said that it could fund uh, your schooling if you want to go to art school. So I was like, oh, this is the goal. Like, I need this. I want to become an artist so I can go to school in California. But they told me only uh, VA, which is fine art studios, only those students have ever gotten a scholarship. No one in design, no one from the hive where you're game designing. So I don't know, it's kind of, I was like, OK, maybe I can be the first one from the hive. So I adapted. This is my first design project ever. I got to create a paper craft uh, for Day of the Dead, uh, Miliano Zobata, which is uh, a leader in the Mexican Revolution. Um, and I got to create AR, a map of my city of San Antonio, and talking about the mid-histories. And I got to create a video game. So I felt like I was a video game designer. I was designing paper crafts. I felt like I was, I felt like really, I felt like I was really artistic. And I started becoming a student. I felt like an all-star. I was super happy. But I also felt like Spider-Man because I tried to keep my life separate. I still have my life uh, in high school, but then I also had my life at SAC, and those were like two different lives. And after high school, I'd go to SAC, but I would never want those two lives to be mixed because at school, you know, I was a cool kid. I, at least I tried to be, and I wanted to fit in, and I didn't want anyone knowing I was going to SAC because I thought it wasn't cool. I thought it wouldn't fit the culture I was in. No one's doing this. It's kind of weird. Like, I need to hide it. And my friends would text me after school, hey, like, where are you, dude? Why don't you ever reply to us after school? Like, where do you go? You only reply at night. And be like, I don't know. I was just, I was just doing things. Like, I don't know. But the main reason I was, I just didn't want anyone to know is because I was embarrassed of my work. I just didn't want to share that. I didn't want to share that at all. Finally, um, 
I got to do what I wanted to do. I got to create an animation in a hive. And I finally got to uh, create a story and do animation. And while I was doing it, I couldn't finish it. I, I, realized, I realized something, that I don't like animating. I just like looking at animation. It wasn't for me. And I didn't tell anyone. I mean, I've already told everyone that I wanted to go, I wanted to be an animator, so I kept this to myself. I was like, okay, no one can know this. Like, now I feel like I was hiding myself from my mom, my family. I felt like I was hiding myself from my friends. I feel like I was hiding myself from everywhere. Um, I was going into my junior year at this time, and uh, there's a school called Cass Tech, which is um, uh, in district charter public school. Um, I wasn't enjoying my time at high school, and I just felt really bad that I was hiding myself, and I wanted to change. Uh, but I heard about this school, uh, uh, and their focus is business, design, and coding, and I was super interested. Uh, and uh, they work with industry partners, too. So they work with people like you know, pe designers and coders and business people in USA and HEB and all these huge companies in my city. Um, and I, at the moment, I was like, I'm in junior year, like I was halfway through, but um, I thought it would be perfect for my little brother. Like my little brother is just about to go into high school. He's, he's uh, about to be a freshman. This would be a perfect opportunity for him. I enjoyed my time at Stacy so much now, I, I fell in love with it, and I thought, you know, maybe my brother uh, could have something too. So here's my little brother right here. And he wasn't doing so good in the school, and I thought this would be a perfect opportunity for him. So I told him about it. I said, like, Daniel, you should apply. I told my mom you should, he should apply. So, um, and while we were applying, I was like, there's no way I could apply. Like, but I thought this was a great school. So we took a tour of the school. Uh, it was a beautiful school. And their motto is like, real dreams, real futures. So they're so dedicated uh, about just making your dreams come true. Um, and here's more of a picture of the school. And we got to take a tour, and I loved the glass walls. Like, no other school I've ever seen before. Like, it was not like the normal high schools that, uh, that I was used to seeing. It just felt more open, felt more free. And I was, like, so excited for my brother. And then finally, um, we got up to the booth where we sign up, uh, I guess, a front desk. And I was like, all right, Daniel, do you want to sign up? He was like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And they looked at me like, Jonathan, do you want to sign up? And I was like, no, well, no, I was thinking, no, no, there's no way. But I was like, but like that did not come out. I was like, okay, sure, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. The school also had the first UX high school pathway. At the time, the UX, uh, the design, I guess, department was working with USA to create their first UX design pathway as the first of its kind. Um, and I, but at the time, I was like, what's UX? I thought maybe it was like a new art form. I was like, oh, is this, is UX a new art form? Is like, I was super intrigued. I had no idea what it was. Uh, what was this program? Um, they had industry partners come in and do a workshop, and I got to talk to a UX center at USA, and they're, they're telling me what UX is and what's the process, and they're saying they work with teams and they uh, lead projects and just design creative stuff, and I was like, oh wow, that's actually exactly what I, uh, exactly what I love doing at SAC. Like this would be perfect for me. This would be perfect for me. Um, and at, uh, at that time, at the design. Uh, design pathway, we're interested in taking six students to go visit Savannah College of Art and Design, which is a uh, super uh, prestigious um, design school in Georgia. And they're like, uh, they're interested in taking uh, six students. And I was just like, wow, um, like a uh, high school is taking uh, students to go visit an art school? Like, I've never heard of that. Like, usually you just go to, a, the, you know, the regular normal uh, schools uh, for academics, but this was a design school. So I said, okay, like, I, I want to go here. And I was able to be one of the six students to uh, go, so here's all of us on the stairs. We flew to Savannah, and during this time, it was spring break of 2020, and, you know, little did I know, COVID was uh, creeping up. Uh, we got to explore the city. We got to drive around. Um, we got to hang out too with my buddies here, and uh, it was like a history and design uh, trip. So our history and design teachers were there, and it was just a great experience. And I finally got to visit the school, and the school is beautiful too. It was very creative. It felt like it had all the resources, and uh, and the dorms were beautiful, and it was just scattered everywhere. And here's a picture of us hanging out after in the elevator. Anyway, we were leaving. Um, and we're on a plane, on a plane back. Um, it was a quick three-day trip. And I was thinking to myself, oh, like this is, this is like, I just, I'm super interested. I feel like maybe I should go here, but I was super scared. I didn't want to just like break my mom's heart or 
you know, you know, tell her that I don't want to do this after all, and her being super shocked. And I feel like I had to make a decision uh, on that plane, and I was thinking about it. And she picked me up. She finally picked me up from the airport, and we're driving. And she's like, "How was the trip? Was it fun? Did you see anything? Was it interesting? Like, what did you like there? You know, do you, are you interested? Are you still interested in going to California? What are you thinking?" And I told her. Mom, I, I want to be a designer. I want to go into this instead. And, and it took a lot of courage because so far I've been telling everyone to be an animator. So she said, okay, like, let's make it happen. And I realized all the stuff that I created at Stacy wasn't art, it was actually design. And after that, you know, I was at Cast Tech, I was like, all right, I want to design internships. And I was, Cast Tech offered high school over internships, and I was able to get a few design internships, uh, quite a lot, to use my skills. So I was super happy, I felt super confident. And then senior year came, and it was time uh, to apply to college. So I applied to SCAD. I, you know, I wanted to go here. And I searched up uh, the Adobe Creativity Scholarship. I was like, well, now I don't really apply, or really apply for it. But I searched it up anyway, and I couldn't find it. I was like, where is the scholarship? Why? You know, I couldn't find it anywhere. But instead, I found the Adobe Design Circle Scholarship. It was, it was like exactly what I was looking for. It was design focused. I felt like you know, the scholarship was exactly what I needed. And I felt like uh, I applied, uh, like I met the requirements perfectly. So I applied, um, and then during this time, it was just uh, kind of scary because I didn't want to talk about college at all. You know, SCAD is an expensive school. Uh, it's like there's no way I could afford it. So I was just thinking, like, you know, how am I going to pay for this? Like, you know, I've, I've got the acceptance letter to SCAD, but there's just still a lot of stress I was feeling, and I was scared that uh, if I talked about it, maybe my dream of being a, a designer, or being a creative, wouldn't come true. Um, and it was a, a, every time my mom would ask me, "All right, you know, do you need anything else from school? What's happening?" I just wouldn't talk about it, like switch the subject, uh, and I just get away from any college talk at all. But finally, uh, I got the email. I was super happy. It was on June 3rd. I saw the email. I was like, "Congratulations!" At first, I like no, I reread it like twice. But, uh, and I like, I got it, I felt so happy. I felt like this, was, this is all of what I worked for. And I called my mom, I was like, mom, guess what? You won't believe it, like I got the scholarship. And I felt like this re like, reaffirmed the path I was on. Because of all the hard work that I've done at SAC, I felt like it paid off. And after that, I felt like I was everywhere. All this work at SAC and at Cast Tech, I was on the news. I felt like I had more press than the president at the time. You know, It was like, uh, uh, I was able to be, you know, I, I met my goal. I was able to be creative. Uh, it was exciting. I was so happy. Um, I was. I feel like I was on top. Like this was. This was all I worked for. And then high school uh, ended, and I had to get on a plane and fly to Savannah. And uh, here's a picture of me on a plane, looking down at the city of uh, Savannah. Um, and I was just reflecting on like you know how much I was able to get done, and, and just like I was so grateful uh, to have these opportunities. And I realized that you know, SCAD was kind of similar. You know, it was creative culture like SACI was, and it worked with industry kind of like Castech was. Except this time, going into this, I had design projects, I had internships, and I had Adobe support. I was like, yeah, like, you know, I, you know, I can. This is pretty good. Like, I, you know, I have something to back up behind. Like, I can just repeat the same thing again. Like, I can, you know, be successful in, in SCAD, and this was super exciting. Uh, here's some of the work that I created. I learned how to 3D model. Uh, I went to color theory. I learned how to render. Um, it was it was super exciting, um, but while I was there, it was a different culture. Uh, you know, I wasn't used to this. I feel like you know, no one looked like me. I couldn't relate to what anyone was talking about, and I felt myself becoming like the quiet kid again, like in the back, uh, like trying not to talk, like trying to get in. Like I don't know. I felt it was. I felt. I felt. Um, I couldn't find you know where I belonged. It just. I felt scared. And I felt like it wasn't for me. And it was, I don't know, it was a hard time. I thought, how could this be? Like, everything I worked for, I'm here now. Like, I should be grateful that I'm here. I should be, like, happy, uh, celebrating. But I still felt this way. I just, it felt, um, I felt really bad. And then, uh, luckily, uh, I thought of ways to, like, you know, how can I be engaged? How can I jump back? And I was like, okay, I'm going to create a personal brand. I'm going to find my why. This is the time where I find design now. You know, design found me. How can I take control? This is uh, me finding design. I thought I can create a personal brand. I can find my why. Um, so I designed to create a world where people wake up feeling thoughtful and end the day trusting in themselves and the community they're in. And I feel like that's the uh, area where I thrive, and I want to bring that to the world when I design. And so I joined uh, the UX club at SCAD, which is called Flux. 
uh, and you know, I felt like this was my tribe, where I belonged, and I wanted to be an officer there because they do all sorts of events and workshops. So I applied, and I just found out uh, two days ago that I was going to be UX officer, event coordinator. So I'll be, you know, creating community like I had at SAC. So I was, you know, super happy, um, and I hope one day. You know, Pendleton Ward inspired me so much, and I hope one day that I can inspire someone else like Pendleton Ward inspired me to say, hey, look, I look like him. I can do it, too. So this is where I'm at right now. So this is a future. Um, I don't know what, I still haven't all figured it out. Um, I'm still a freshman in high school. I'm a, uh, not high school, a freshman in college, and I'm a 19-year-old. Um, but I hope in the future I can share my culture with the world. I can support my city's creative community. And I can inspire, inspire our next generation of design diversity by, I don't know, creating YouTube or just being online. And I'm here today, you know, hopefully to get others to invest in that generation. Thank you so much. My name is Sean Thanks. Just want to say thanks, Jonathan, for that. I, th uh, I think we can sit down and maybe. Um, have a little bit of discussion. And if there are audience questions, like I think uh, if you put them through Slido, they'll show up here eventually. Um, so uh, great job. How do you feel? Uh, I feel uh, excited to be here. It's an right. interesting way to start a design career. Yeah. I, I, I'm just so, um, like we were working together to put the, the, the slides together. Uh, I mean, he was doing the work, but I was just sort of giving you some pointers. And I'm just so glad that that like uh, it really feels like your authentic self came out in those slides and really got to see who you are and, and your story. Um, and I think in the beginning you were a, little, a bit hesitant to do that. Um, do you feel now that you're at SCAD and you've been there since the fall that you've been able to hit that, that groove where you're all able to be like yourself there with your peers, with your teachers in that environment yet? Yeah, I would, I would say I am. Um... I have roommates too, and every time we talk, I show them like, you know, some of the Tejano music that I have, and I, sh you know, share part of my culture, and I tell them like the foods that I had, and um, and we share. Like, it's cool, like seeing a different perspective, and I feel like, um, you know, even though I feel like I don't fit in, I guess sharing that is like, it makes it, you know, it makes it fun. I'm learning yeah. new stuff. I mean, one of the things people say about um, when you go to college for the first time is like you find your your people or your tribe and. Um, and I think that's a, that's a common experience for people who go to, you know, like a full university or liberal arts college where there's lots of different kinds of people and maybe the population is bigger. But I, I went to art school as well and um, so oftentimes, I don't know how, how many people are at SCAD, but oftentimes the population is actually relatively small and um, you don't always get that experience. You don't always find your people and sometimes it can be quite lonely. Is that anything like what you've experienced? So um, SCAD is like super huge, uh, yeah. as like 14,000 students. So it's a it's a big school, and yeah, I, I, at the time I felt kind of lost because um, I, I didn't know where anything was. I was new there. I was away from my family. You yeah. know, like your family is like your rock. So you at the end of the day, you'd always come home and have something to go with. So being here, being at SCAD, it was it was very different. Um, but I think the at US Club was like kind of my tribe. Yeah. And you know, uh, our when you go to art school, everyone's like an artist, and they have like, you know, they dress like an artist, but when you see a designer, it's like, okay, like, you're probably a designer. You can kind of tell. Uh, and I feel like the US Club was exactly like, um, there were a group of designers, and uh, that's where I feel like maybe that's where my job So how can you tell that someone's a designer? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, I guess they dress there. I feel like uh, designers are a little bit more chill, um, and, you know, maybe they're, um, you know, a little more, I, I don't know, straightforward or, you know, thinking about a lot of stuff. And while well, artists is like, you know, artists express stuff, designers like solve problems, right? Yeah. So that's, and you can, I don't know, I feel like you kind of tell that in personality or whatever. Right, right. And is that understanding of, a, of what a designer is or who a designer was, is that something that you've acquired since you've, you got to school or did you have a conception of that before you went there? So I feel like uh, my whole journey is like, what am I? What's creative? And at the time when I started, wanting, when I wanted to be an artist, um, to when I wanted to be an animator, I got to like really understand like the definition. Um, and I feel like it wasn't until senior year where I really understood like what's the difference between a designer and artist. Because yeah. some, I mean, I feel like a lot of people don't know what a designer is, or they think of artists first things first. But 
but like explaining that I'm a designer, like, okay, what, what does a designer do? That's how I was able to learn. So how do you explain what a designer is, especially now that you have a bit more exposure to it? How do you explain that to, you know, your, your family, your friends at home, people who aren't in the, that orbit of design? So when I first heard UX design, I thought it was like a, like a new art form. Yeah. So I didn't understand it at all. Um, and when people would ask me, like, what pathway is in, I'd say UX design, and they're like, oh, like, what is it? And I was like, uh, you know, I don't know, like, you were interact with stuff, and I was like, oh, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't get it. But I feel like a designer uh, solves uh, problems creatively, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that's what they really do. So for a UX designer to, you know, I'm studying to be a student UX designer, I feel like they, you know, think about the experience that the user's gonna have, but they're solving that problem really creatively. Um, so that's how I tell people, like, that's what I do. And uh, and if they want to go into specifics, I will probably, their minds will probably be blown just because there's just right. so much there. But. Right, right. Um, and how about, um, you know, the mentorship part of it? Did you anticipate that, like, I'm sure when you were looking at the scholarship, you're like, oh, this, this is going to help me fund it. But the mentorship part, um, did you anticipate how that would play into your career at SCAD? And what, what's... How is it figured in? So, um, you know, that's like a like an added benefit. I think I didn't think about it. Being at SCAD, some of the people there already have like industry connected connections, or like their dad was a designer, and just how they figure out designs, how they're able to afford the school. And so, I can't imagine if I didn't have you know that that mentorship, like how I would get into that you know area. But I don't know. I like Corey. You're you're my mentor, so. Uh, you know, I guess realizing like, oh my gosh, like I have this opportunity where I can, you know, meet with you anytime and uh, you know, work, help, you know, get your support on working on projects. Uh, I don't know, it felt really good. Like it felt like, um, you know, like, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know, yeah. but something like uh, I felt more confident and uh, especially since it was really hard, it's kind of like, I feel right. like um, there was a, a shot there. And you mentioned that some of your um, your peers at school they might have had um, uh, you know earlier exposure to what design is than, than you did. You said some of them maybe their their parents were designers or had maybe were in adjacent fields somehow. Like, mm -hmm. How do you um, what's it like to be in those that environment where it's it's you know uh, there there are folks who are who are ostensibly more steeped in in this craft than, than you were. Um, it's interesting because, you know, I went, I had safety and cast tech where I got to have internships and design, um, and I was able to work towards, you know, I guess design, but I feel like I'm like more experienced in that way where, you know, I have all this experience because I worked super hard to get here in order to, you know, figure it out. And, and the students I talk to, they're, they don't have, I mean, they don't have the experience, um, but they know about design, they have those connections, um, and they're able to go. So it's kind of like uh, when I got there, I thought maybe oh everyone, is, everyone has creative stuff. I thought it's going to be super competitive, but it's like okay, everyone's like first, starting from a fresh start. Yeah. Um, and no one really has, has started anything yet. Okay. Um, and just kind of just went. Um, so yeah. Yeah. That's mine. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I just remember when I was in our school, there was always like that one or two students who were like were already doing like some sort of freelance work or client work, and they were like. It was almost like they were like, um, you know, just doing school for fun because they were already professionals. And I always felt so intimidated <laughs> by them because like, they were when they were advanced. And maybe, maybe it's like upper class or something. Like, do you do you see that already? And are there people like that who are from similar backgrounds for, um, as you at all? No one from uh, similar backgrounds for me. Um, uh, no, there's. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I'm like the only like Hispanic in the design club. Oh, okay. Uh, or um, uh, but I don't know. I haven't met anyone who uh, goes to, like doing a design like that. Right. There are some people who like started businesses and have their own like clothing line too. So I was like, oh, okay, that's like really yeah. advanced. Like I was super surprised to see that. But um, yeah. yeah, that helped answer your question. Yeah. Um, and have you? I know it's only your first year in a four-year program, but have you started thinking about like what kind of what kind of job you would want afterwards? Like if you would want to work in in studios or you know in house, or mm -hmm. if you um, want to work in spe on specific kinds of uh, problems or in specific industries. I, I that 
You know, I'm not sure yet. I'm not sure. Yeah, and I think that's where I'm at right now is, like, trying to figure it out. Like, I feel like I know why I do what I do, but I feel like I haven't figured out the rest. Like, I'm not sure where I want to go after. I'm mm -hmm. not sure uh, if I want to go in-house or work for a company or work for yeah. an agency. Um, I don't know. Like, I haven't figured that out yet, and that's where I'm at. How about, like, thinking back to your experience before college at Cast Tech um, and um, your peers there, like, what... What advice would you offer, um, like a, a you know slightly younger version of yourself who's going through that right now? Um, uh, I I used to mentor at SAC. Uh, they offered something about SAC is like they have middle school program too. Yeah. So they uh, and the high schoolers like get to mentor the middle schoolers, and it's super cool because like a paid program too. And I was like, well, this is like amazing, and I wanted to be that. And um, there's a middle schooler, Robert. His name is Robert. Um, and now he's in high school, he's starting a high school program, and he emails me all the time, because I was his mentor, so he emails me questions. Okay. He's like, John, you know, I'm going, I'm going to do this project at the Hive, like, you know, what should I do, what do you think about this, or how do, you know, how do I do good at Cast Tech, because I went to Cast Tech, um, and I just tell him, like, just keep, just, you know, do what you love, and just keep working at it, and I, right. and I email him, um, and I think that's really, like, just, just keep going, just, like, yeah. uh, determination, just, like, have that, just right. do what you love and just keep creating, and uh, I feel like it'll all just like fall into place. What, what, what do you think like um, kids like that um, can do to get exposure to like a wider range of you know understanding of, of what they can do afterwards, whether it's design or other things? Like I think it, it seems like you were just so lucky to be able to take that trip to mm -hmm. SCAD and, and sort of see for yourself, and I'm not sure that. Uh, the opportunity would have been as, as, as real for you if that hadn't happened? That's a good question, yeah. Um, I'm definitely very fortunate, uh, and I'm very grateful. I'm not sure. That's, like, definitely a problem uh, in design. Uh, but, you know, I'd say uh, there's a UX designer, and there's a designer who came and talked to me during a workshop mm. and told me what design is, and that's where I really got to hear it. So I think maybe that's the goal, is just, like, uh, getting involved in those communities and like speaking to them because I had no idea this was like a whole other career or what it was. Yeah. And I was like amazed when I, you know, finally right. like I got to talk to someone who was actually yeah. doing it, and it was like, I, it was like okay, like yeah. something like that. For right. Sure. Right. Great. Well, um, if, I don't know if there are any questions we can take from the audience, um, but I think that's it. So just a little early. Thank you so much for coming and uh, and telling us your story. Thank you so much. Thank you all.